Uh, this is Justin from the Metabolic Nutritionist Podcast, and today I've got Ben Patrick on from the Athletic Truth Group. Uh, ben is a world leader in knee health and knee strength, and while that sounds impressive, I highly recommend you do yourself a favor and you head over to Knees Over Toes Guy on Instagram right now and follow him, because there you'll have to see some of the incredible transformations that he has had to bring people from surgery all the way through to the best performance they've had throughout their whole life. So Ben, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate you, and I've been looking forward to this one because I think it's the first time I've been on a nutrition podcast, and while I answer all my clients' questions about everything, so I do answer diet stuff, there's no doubt that I devote my time proportionally to knees. So I'm looking forward to diving in deeper and learning more about nutrition with you as well. Brilliant. Um, I think a good place to start is you posted recently about the equator diet, so maybe you can fill people yeah. in what exactly that is. Yeah, so I call it the equator diet because I'm referring to the relative position of where a food grows best in relation to the equator. Mm -hmm. So certain foods can grow better in northern climates, certain foods can grow better more towards the equator. So it's just an overall diet philosophy. It, it doesn't break into great detail. I try to start with the most elemental basics. And for diet, that's as far as I've gotten. It has not gotten very detailed. And the elemental basic for me is that I noticed that athletes don't always respond on the same exact diet. Mm -hmm. And I, I think, look, I think any natural diet is going to work better than the processed stuff that's out there. But when it comes to specific athletes, I find they tend to thrive better on foods that grow in areas more likely that their bodies would have evolved in. So for me, as a paler white guy, okay, I need to earn – my mango, which grows best around the equator by doing a more equator activity, some kind of outdoor exercise that, you know, really gets things going. Um, but if I'm just sitting at home, I'd be better off maybe eating an apple uh, than a mango, with, which will have like, you know, more starchy sugar and stuff like that. So that's just a real microcosm of, of it. it. You could, someone could take it as far as they want. They can do as much research as they want. Let's face it. I'm also shifting the emphasis away from cookies, which only grow in the North Pole, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the equator diet philosophy is ultimately trying to get people to putting more attention on eating real foods and understanding that nature did a really good job of providing because the, the real big issue is the processed foods, right? So it's equator diet is half strategy and half also just getting people to shift more attention on natural food. Definitely. I think you made a really good point at the beginning of the podcast, which you do focus on. Uh, well, I think that's your thing. It's your, your branding is you're the knees guy, but all of the training that you do provide is so much broader than that. And part of that does kind of, as you said, fit in. There is an element of that, which is the diet itself. Um, yeah. For knee health itself, specifically, when you're bringing someone who says have had serious surgery and they want to uh, overcome that, you have your exercises that you perform or you, you talk about, which brings a lot of blood flow into the knee area itself. Um, yeah. Are there any specific foods or, or supplements that you do recommend that could help that, that should be within the body that is obviously going to be in the bloodstream when it goes to the knees? Yeah. So I don't personally take any supplements because I like to leave that in the line of someone like yourself who's really going to be analyzing it from that perspective. So I just do the training. It's also for the same reason I don't do any kind of body work. I refuse anyone who offers any kind of body treatment or foam rollers or massage or laser technique. I refuse any and all body work because I need to know what's coming from my system, right? And I also need to know what can be accomplished just with base foods because not everyone's going to be able to afford certain supplements. There's different, you know, levels of what people can afford. So anything, all my results are come from the system without assistance plus base foods. But if you're looking at foods, there's no doubt there that eating a healthier diet having less body fat, less inflammation, easier to build muscle. Because when you've had a surgery, you're up against two things. One is you're getting out of shape because you can't exercise. Hmm. And so we know that every pound, and, and often this leads to, after a knee surgery, this leads to going to the weight room and doing upper body because you can't do lower body. But every one pound up top adds four pounds of pressure to your knees. So you're looking at that you're going to need to be able, once you do start being able to exercise your legs with something like my system, you need to be able to put that muscle tissue on to make up for any imbalances that you may have accumulated, not to mention all the loss of muscle mass. It can be scary after some knee surgeries, how your leg just shrivels up to nothing, right? Mm -hmm. 
And then not to mention, as you said, with the blood flow, that becomes a huge factor. The blood flow is one of the main communication signals in the body that can get the healing to happen in the first place. So I try to eat a diet that really reflects that. And again, since I'm not enough of a specialist to take any wild chances, I keep it really simple and I eat a balance of meat, vegetables, and fruit. And I try to eat them more according to what would be naturally occurring. So my, I try to get more of my vegetables in the kale and greens department every night before bed. I eat a big, I take a head of kale and I break it up and I put olive oil and balsamic vinegar on it. And then I'll be honest, in relation to my training, my body really craves meat. And so I'll tend to eat meat in relation to, you know, how intense the resistance training is. But I don't try to judge for someone, you know, what selections they should make. I just try to give them an overall framework that they're going to be, you know, diving into it more for themselves. Just how I'm a knee specialist, if someone wants to get the fullest out of diet, I think they should go to a diet specialist. Definitely. And I think it's really interesting that you're saying, oh, I don't take any supplements. And people going to my page, they'll see recommendation after recommendation to take certain supplements itself. And they may think, oh, Justin wants people to take tons of supplements. In the ideal world, I wish people could get all of that from food. But Charles Polican yeah. was also talking about always about that, you know, 50 years ago, an apple from 50 years ago had so much more nutrition than an apple from nowadays. And that's why so true. I'm gravitating more and more towards, say, things like the carnivore diet or a more meat-based diet itself. Not necessarily because I don't like vegetables, but just because they are so much more nutrient dense and you can get a lot more out of your food, calorie per calorie, for eating meat versus eating a lot more of the, uh, of the vegetables and, and definitely for carbohydrates. Um, it makes sense. And, and when you mention supplements, yeah, it's like if I do my job really well and then you do your job really well, then someone's going to get the maximum. So you probably know supplements that are proven to improve blood flow. You probably know this, whereas I don't. But... If I knew that, then I might be using that and then not knowing how much I'm getting from my knee system. So I like to use that approach of, of not knowing too much on that side so that a specialist in that area can master that side. But so what would you say? What would you say for blood flow from in terms of what you put into your body, whether it be food, supplements, water? What, I mean, what would you say to improve circulation? Um, so it's not going to be a popular answer because sometimes you get these kind of questions where, oh, for liver health, what should I do for this? Or my uh, aunt has this disease or this or whatever. And really the ultimate, it comes down to the big basics and it's not popular. They wish people could just take a pill and that could help it. But right. I'm yeah. with you, to be honest, eating the good quality food that's completely non-processed, that you've cooked all of yourself, that doesn't have any of the things such as uh, vegetables in them. You just cook with something like ghee or butter um, or something like a good quality virgin olive oil. Um, and then getting your eight hours sleep, nine hours sleep or more. If yes. You it, yes. It's really um, and Dude. then think adding in the proper training itself where you're getting that blood flow, those three things are going to do way more than any supplement else. A supplement is only going to get maybe a fraction of a percent. And if you're a, a top level athlete, then maybe you're going to do things like, okay, you want to boost up citrulline and arginine. You're going to want to get more things like uh, they can beat, uh, beat the juice in your diet itself. But ultimately, they're not going to do quite as much as just eating good quality food and getting your sleep. And people don't nail those basics. That's really good advice. And I find that sleep is a big one too. And uh, I'd love to go into more things in terms of application, right? Because I've found that for most people, there's only one way that I can get them enough sleep. Hmm. Okay. It doesn't matter about uh, any other factors in terms of what's the most likely one to get them enough sleep. And hmm. you know what I have to do to get most people enough sleep what's is that? I have to get them to make a pact to cut out TV. <laughs> you, I, if, unless they make a pact to cut out TV. And so I do this with myself. The most productive year of my life, I went one year, no entertainment, no movies, no TV, no Netflix, no nothing. I love those things. Don't get me wrong. But that's what I had to do so that at night I would just be like, fuck it. It's 830. I'm going to go to sleep. And what, what happens is you start waking up earlier and you start waking up. Right. So I wake up like as soon as it's not, it's not even first light outside. I call it not pitch black. Okay. At first, not pitch black. My dog is ready to fucking go. Okay. My dog is up and ready and trying to wake up me and my wife. And we're like, oh God. But you know what? Then by 830, we don't turn on the TV and we're actually tired and fall asleep. But I notice if we don't have the pack, so we're doing another six months right now, six months, no TV. We're like a month in. Energy is incredible all day. 
we fall asleep when it gets dark. We wake up when it gets light. It's amazing. But I just have to be honest. There's no way. And I've never been able to stick to it and get adequate sleep because I'm a hard worker, right? And when you're a hard worker, you want to keep working and then it's late in the day. And so for me personally, I just, I, I never get good enough sleep unless I do these periods where I completely cut out TV. Hmm. I, I was just shooting a video just earlier today about this kind of the thing where people go, uh, oh no, I could never live without that. And I think things like TV come up, things like uh, or giving up bread or gluten or sugar. Oh no, I could never live without that. But then at the same time, they still look at someone's body and go, oh man, I wish I could look like that. Or I wish I could be rich. I wish I could have a successful business or whatever it is. But they're not- Our like, ancestors without lived without that for forever. And I think it does something to you spiritually when you cut out something that gives you your happiness, right? So that, you know, the, the bad food, the TV, we're asking for something else to make us happy. And so I think it's a really good lesson, even if someone doesn't do it forever, but at least to find out for themselves, what are you really made of without trying to get things to make you happy? I think it does something really good for you spiritually to, to cut out some things like that, as you were saying. Definitely. But most people live in a kind of fear-based world. Like, oh, I'm afraid that, oh, uh, I get this disease. So I need to run away from that rather than saying like, I'm pursuing health. Uh, and I think that's a big difference. It's very easy to stick to a diet when you're going like, oh, this is my goal. This is where I'm aiming for. This is a challenge. This is something that I nearly see as my hobby and my passion and what's fun. Uh, and once you approach yeah. it from that end, you have no end of energy to be able to pursue that. Um, and maybe a good kind of topic to kind of switch into as well. What are some daily routines that you have that you have to do every single day? Because I think that kind of slots into talking about cutting out TV as well. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't have anything too, you know, too odd or crazy. I think the big one for me is probably just, I, I keep a, a really strict schedule. And so in my iPhone, I have my notes and one of them is my schedule. I mean, it, it tells me everything I have to do on a given day. I have it set up Monday through Sunday. If something's the following week, then I put it in for the following week and just really living like that and knowing what I have to get done one done when it really stabilizes things for me it, it orders my production for the day so that's my main one i mean i wake up i walk my dog every day but it's i don't have some like special uh stretch routine or special exercise routine that i do every day i have very very balanced you know where i uh you know where i do my training and stuff but it, i i don't have um a certain regimented uh routine outside of just following those notes, make sure it makes sure I don't miss anything. You know what I mean? It allows me to, to keep coming up with new things and keeping my ideas. So I don't forget them. There's mm -hmm. nothing worse than having a great idea and then forgetting what it was. So that's, that's my main one. Uh, but I don't have any kind of like tricks. You know what I mean? It's just, I have those notes. I never, you know, forget what I have going on and, and stuff like that. Again, it comes what down about you? to you, isn't it? I think it's just kind of like, if you just nail it. Well, for me, I, I feel it's very important. I always have a very structured day. So I've got a list of daily yeah, yeah. Uh, things like I'm part of, or part of real movement. So that is a task on the day where I, every day I check in, we've got an accountability group to make sure that we do our nice. set our daily goals or weekly goals, our monthly goals. I, and the thing I like that. that. Well, not having those things ticked off or not good. Um, so even things like um, I've got a reminder on my phone for every 30 minutes to stand up. It's a little thing, oh, wow. but it's so easy that when you are behind a computer or you're working all day sitting down, that you feel it at the end of the day, that you feel it in your joints, you don't necessarily yep. feel good. So I feel so much better with that. Uh, things like drinking two to three liters of water. It's so easy to forget these basic things that if I find that I just have a piece of paper where I tick it off every single day, that works yep. for me very, very easily. Um, and that's the thing where probably people get lost as well. Yeah. They don't necessarily remind themselves of the basic things that they need to do. Uh, it's so yeah. we forget, yeah, you sit down and you switch the TV on and you forget that that's something that you've made a pact to not actually do as well. Um, the so yeah. biggest thing I see, yeah, I see people all the time and, and a lot of people I've worked with as well and they don't have the list of their things. They don't have their, their schedule in order, their daily routines in order, often forgetting things, you know what I mean? Um, yeah, it's a huge one. That's For me, that's like the, what could I not live without? would be my, my daily schedule that I keep up to date. Perfect. Um, something else I want to move into, and it, we're not going to go into full detail about what you do to improve knee health because you have a ton of stuff up on your Instagram as well, which I again recommend that people go over to, to see and check out the, uh, the ATG program. But um, I recently had an accident, I hurt my knee and I started to just do two basic exercises, which was the, um, uh, the Patrick setup up and the KOT, just a partial range of motion, the KOT squat. Yeah. Um, 
and just high repetitions with that. And the first one I started, uh, you know, I could feel my knee every single time I stepped a step. And after that, I was doing it for about a week and a half and it completely cleared up. So wow. it's incredible how fast these kind of things work when, when they really are applied. And I'm always just curious to see, um, I know you do kind of explain these things, but where exactly did you find this origin? Because you yourself had some injuries. You had some uh, surgeries on your uh, legs as well. A lot of different problems. How did you actually discover these things? What was your process to, to, to figure out how to solve that? Yeah, it was, it was pretty simple, really. Um, I was a, you know, a, a classic pity case of a basketball player who started having chronic knee pain when I was 12 years old. By 18, I was three surgeries in chewed up and spit out never achieved my lifelong goal of dunking you know couldn't play the game I loved without really nasty pain I was addicted to painkillers so my life honestly I didn't have friends I didn't have a you know a girlfriend my life was pretty pretty messed up from my knees you know because that was my outlet that's who I was everything I did as a kid it was all about becoming a basketball player I was obsessed with it and that's honestly why I ran into so many problems so soon is because I was such a hard worker mm. that I was doing what I thought would make me jump higher. But really, I was just doing things so much that the stats show, you know, jumping in people under age 40, jumping's the number one cause of knee pain and surgery. So I was trying so hard to do these things. But at, at 9, 10, 11, I just thought I was getting ahead. I thought I was going to be the next, you know, in my mind, I would go to sleep watching Michael Jordan dunk at night. I wasn't having dreams of the nightmare surgeries I was about to have. That was never part of the equation, even though statistically, if you just keep jumping and jumping and jumping, and then your strength training is only built on acceleration and not training the muscles of deceleration. So 669% more money is spent studying how to accelerate more than decelerate. But hmm. they recently did a study on 13 to 15 year old kids. One group did forward sprinting one group did backwards sprinting at the end of the eight weeks the group that only ran backwards got faster at running forwards than the group that ran forwards and they gained four times more vertical jump height that doesn't mean that that doesn't mean you shouldn't run backwards it means we're already doing that too much and we're missing out on key muscles which actually handle the forces so what you mentioned there you're doing exercises that the muscles animate our body. So are we animating it only to express force? Or are we animating it to then be able to handle the same force that causes you to jump is going to be different from muscles when you land. The same muscles that cause you to run forward are different than the muscles that cause you to slow down. Hmm. And so we're, we're putting all this energy on the speeding up without the energy on the slowing down. Yet the studies really indicate you're only going to speed up to the degree that you can slow down. And it's on the slowing down is where we get hurt it's not the expression it's then being able to handle that expression that we get hurt and so that all that whole journey of this knees over toes thing started when i was 20 years old still years after surgery still struggling and it was a quote from charles falcon that said the athlete whose knee goes farthest and strongest over his toes is most protected mm. and this was backwards of everything my doctor physio and trainer had told me in the no knees over toes and so of course, some trainers are not saying no knees over toes, but believe it or not, the majority still say no knees over toes, even though that's been proven false. And even though it's been proven that the better your knee can go over your toe on a step down, the less chance of, of knee injury you have, the more mobile your ankle that your knee can go over your toe, mm -hmm. the less chance of knee injury you have, but they haven't put that together into exercises yet that anyone can do. So there's more advanced exercises that you see in Olympic weightlifting and full knee bend squats and even those olympic weightlifters have 37 percent thicker tendons than non-olympic weightlifters and olympic weightlifters even though it looks like they're trying to destroy their knees have more stable and healthier knees than basketball and soccer players and that's trying to destroy it and i don't even advise that i even advise the way i train the full bend is you know one leg at a time the atg style split squat because even the ratio between legs if one leg is stronger than the other and you go out to play rugby and you cut off one leg and then go to the other well if the stronger one cuts and the next one has to handle it, that could be your knee pain and your knee injury right there. So you're not only protected by strength in the deceleration muscles, you're also protected by the balance of those muscles. So I try to have the gentlest possible system that anyone can do because that's where I was. I took this clue from Charles Poliquin, but my knees were not ready to do the things that I saw. And so my life has basically been dedicated to a smooth system of that. So there's still, uh, 
so many other areas of strength. And I've tried to learn those to the degree that's needed to stay in balance to those knees, right? If you're going to get now these incredible legs, well, you, your lower back, you'd probably want to be able to keep up with that. You know what I mean? So thing, things of that nature. So it kind of started with the knees and the knees is, is my ultimate job and is the reason why someone would pay me money. I don't ask people to, you know, that's the program I deliver, but I do deliver a full body version that, that does extend out to the things that are likely to then be needed now that you can run faster and jump higher and these kind of things. So it's really been a, a nine year journey of regression of figuring out how to scale back. You watch, you know, Michael Jordan land from a dunk where you think his knee is going to explode and he pops back up. And yet you watch seven other players do that and they tear their ACLs and the rest of their career is altered. How, how does he able to handle that, that range? Mm. The same range that Tom Platts, you know, legendary bodybuilder, best legs of all time, Tom Platts in his 60s, still squatting three plates to each side, ass to grass with incredible mobility in his 60s while his peers are having knee replacements he could handle those positions, right? So you have this thing where these positions that the best can handle, we're told not to do because that's where people get hurt. But the only way to be protected is to work your way to being able to handle those positions. So that's my, that's my life and my career in a nutshell. And I love it. And I'm totally okay with just staying on that mission. That's my life's purpose ultimately is to get these safe progressions that really follow the evidence that th that's there, but there's just not exercises yet. Well, now I have those exercises. Anyone can do them. I mean, if you look on my Instagram right now, it's a 73-year-old is my latest success story who was told he needed double knee replacement. And, of course, I'm working to get it even smoother. But the point is that is how regressed those exercises start. And trust me, the 73-year-old told he needed double knee replacement didn't start with the Tom Blatt's sissy squat. <laughs> okay. So, so there you go. As you can see, I have a little bit of passion about the subject. <laughs> Definitely. Um, I think this is one of the most frustrating things is when you actually learn what works, it's the exact opposite of the mainstream advice or everything that we've been taught before. Uh, and it's the same thing within diet as well. If you look at things like meat, meat is so demonized. And you check out every single study where they've actually shown that meat is bad. And it's always in combination. They just simply take the box of, or oh, are you a meat eater? They don't look at people are eating refined carbohydrates and to what levels. Um, and quite often, if someone is, say, eating a vegetarian or vegan diet, then they're eating they're more conscious of your health. So they're usually eating yeah. a lot less things that are, are bad for them as well. So and then you get a correlation of things like the Hong Kong study or, or uh, in Japan where people are having the longest life expectancy in the whole world and eat the most amount of meat in the world world as well. So it just doesn't make sense. And then you try out things like the carnivore diet and you do it well, not just eating uh, a single type of meat, but you rotate your meats and you get lots of healthy organ meats in there as well. And all of a sudden you notice it's so hard to keep just the body fat on and your strength is up and your energy is up. And especially if that works for your body type as well, because I don't recommend it for everybody. And it's just, just goes so against everything that we've been told before. And you nearly feel cheated because you go, like, how is these people getting this stuff promoted that is not actually helping people? It's hurting people in so many ways. Yeah. And, and I think that, I think that you're right about that. The truth is not always what's broadly publicized. And unfortunately, there's usually vested interest behind these things, you know, in, in knees, it's worldwide knee replacements is a $40 billion a year industry, 40 billion. Hmm. This is over, this is, this is over 3 million knee replacements per year worldwide. Now, a study was done and found that one in three of these knee replacements was advised despite not having conditions warranting a knee replacement. And investigation showed that doctors overprescribe it because it's so profitable. It's these knee replacements are so profitable, $57,000 a pop per mm. knee. Mm. So this 73 year old, don't worry, I sent him a hundred thousand dollar bill. Okay. I'm going to collect. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> but you get my point. It's so profitable. Look how much I make 50 bucks to make him healthy, but a hundred grand to make him unwell. And what's very scary is that, one in a hundred of these knee replacement cases die within six months because of complications due to surgery. Meaning, of course, surgery in many areas has saved lives and has value, but it is quite an aggressive thing to begin with. Mm -hmm. and, and now taking someone who's already struggling with their knees and doing this, then they often run into obesity problems after the knee replacement because now their recovery is so long to even 
And so now, as we know, that the obesity alone, every one pound of, of that body weight adds four pounds to your knees. Mm-hmm. It's not so simple that you can just getting your knee. Let's say your knee was 100 pounds strong and you got it five pounds or even 20 pounds stronger. But if you if you got it 20 pounds stronger and you gained 20 pounds of body fat in life, that manifests a lot more heavily than it appears. So as you can see, there's there's some messed up aspects to the system where the people prescribing, the people maybe, you know, promoting what we should eat are paid by us to be unhealthy. And so it's an unfortunate situation that they feed their families by making people unwell. And in this case, if one in three of these are ill-advised and one in a hundred are dying because of complications, doctors, knee doctors are killing tens of thousands of people worldwide unnecessarily so that they can make more money. That's a fact. It's not an opinion. So I have not looked into diet enough to know the facts, but I know that nature did a pretty good job, damn good job. And I know that we're surrounded by commercial marketing of processed products. And, you know, I, so I, I look at what someone like you is doing and I say, you know, keep pushing the truth forward, man. No, it's it, when you hear it, it's absolutely criminal uh, from things like training, things like knee health and within diets, things like, uh, oh, it's perfectly fine to eat 40 grams of sugar a day or saturated fat is bad for you or, you know, the cholesterol myth you know, thing, or thing of HDL to LDL cholesterol or uh, uh, look at things where demonizing meat. And then when you actually start to introduce all these things and taking out all of the bad foods, your, your, your health just shoots through the roof, your inflammation goes down, your injuries heal up, any skin condition goes away, your autoimmune conditions are completely reversed. That's a big thing. The amount of autoimmune conditions, I haven't looked up the stats, but I wouldn't be surprised. Just walking through the suits, you see so many different people with different issues as well. Um, so no, it's, it's uh, no, I, I, I think it, people have heard it a lot, the whole kind of statement of, uh, oh, no, it's, it's going to be a lot more expensive later down the line. You, know, you can invest, as you said, 50 bucks to find out how to fix your knees from you straight away, or you can spend 100000 down the line. But it just needs to be hammered in because people and, don't... And re- that's only... Yeah, and that's only manufactured. It's really not more expensive right now. The government makes it more expensive. Here's how. So in America, and I'll give both sides so that it's not biased. In America, let's say me and you have farms. We have farms next to each other. Mm. You are a beef farmer. I'm a broccoli farmer. Okay. Now, both of us, our business is struggling. Okay. And the government says, you know what? You don't have to shut down your farms. This is, this is how America works in America. You don't have to shut down your farm. If your farm is struggling, you know why? Because the government will pay you to produce wheat. They'll pay you to produce wheat corn it's called subsidized crops so a government subsidy is saying you can't the industry and that's how these things become so cheap and it creates this illusion that the wheat and the corn are cheap they're not actually that cheap they're made that cheap by the government the government can pick whatever it wants to produce and then the more that there is then the less the price goes down so they know the farmer corn is corn and wheat are so cheap to buy that they don't make money for the farmer. The farmer makes money off the government paying them to make it. Hmm. That, how, how bad does that suck? It's enough. Just, but look it up. It's public. It's public record. The top five, look up the top five subsidized crops in America. And what you'll see is you'll see the top five causes of, of, you know, heart, heart. You'll see the top five causes of death basically. Yeah. And these things sound like conspiracy theories. I think Joe Rogan said it well. I mean, some of things are conspired, you know, sometimes people do are behind these things and you just go, how is it possible that we don't know about it? But yeah, it's, it's just the case. They, uh, they but, make a lot of, they make a lot of money. Definitely. And, you know, it, there's money being made. It's a lot more expensive. Uh, we pay a lot more when we're unhealthy than when we're healthy. So yeah, it, it, yeah, that, that's what we're up against. So yeah, it is going to be tougher to eat healthy. It is going to be tougher to exercise the right way, but, that's what we're up against. Do we want to just accept defeat or do we want to make a, a better world that we can be proud of that our grandkids, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And our great grandkids are going to be living in a better world than we have right now. That's what I'm going for. You know? And that's another good reason to kind of push it and say, I'm going to market. I know the good information. I want to promote that. I want to push that out to as many people as possible. And I hope that you spread it out as well, because you know, if you have a good message behind you and you know how much you can help people, especially 
when you're not asking them to pay you a lot of money because you just want to make a living as well, then ah, I mean, uh, that's definitely a good way to do yeah. it. Um, so maybe- yeah, unfortunately, unfortunately, the most bold are usually the ones who are the biggest dicks. And so those of us who are kind hearted individuals have a duty to become more bold. Mm-hmm. And that's the, you know, this is throughout history and you can see oppressive ruler after oppressive ruler. Why was someone kind hearted, not more bold? You know what I mean? And so it's, it's, a, it's almost a catch 22 that the very nature of someone who wants to dominate everybody else is going to be a, a dick and the very nature of someone who doesn't want to dominate everyone else is going to end up getting screwed. So it's, that's what we're up against. Good guys got to get bold. So what's the next bold step for, for yourself and for ATG? I mean, I'm writing a book right now. I'm three eighths of the way through writing knee abilities, a book. I think a book can help me get more credibility. It's going to be a picture book. It's not going to go into extreme stuff in the sense of, um, you know, like sometimes I train an athlete and he's pain free, but now he wants to win a gold medal. You know, and so I have different numbers. I have a standard number and then I have a world class number. Hmm. So the book is just going to go to the standards and it's going to be, you know, people are going to be able to be reading the book and follow right along and do the exercises. So for me, making a book is my next level of boldness. What's your next level of boldness? Well, I'm uh, promoting the metabolic nutritionist as much as possible. I'm putting out a lot more uh, videos and content because before that I was kind of hiding behind just putting a, a post up because it's very easy. People can't necessarily yeah. judge if you just put an image up and say like vitamin C does this. But when you're speaking, yeah. there's a whole new element to it. And it takes me a lot to get used to it as well because I can speak to a friend about health or nutrition and rant on for about 20 minutes and I turn the camera yeah. off and it's a very different thing. Uh, it doesn't feel all of a sudden, just mine goes blank after five uh, five minutes, uh, like words or anything like that. So it's, uh, um, I think that's the next big step for me to say, hey, I've got all this knowledge I've accumulated for the last ten years, and now I want to put it out there. And uh, I think I've definitely learned from people like yourself and from Keegan to 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 say, put all your knowledge out there, and people will come. People will want to to yeah. get more from you as well. Yeah, and and in terms of the camera thing, people often comment to me, and they're like man, you're great on camera or whatever. And I have to laugh because my wife by trade, my wife is an actress. Okay. (laughs) She's not the most famous actress, but she's been in some movies and she's an amazing actress. And keep in mind, she didn't grow up doing this. So for someone who just started it, uh, you know, she's done incredibly well. And I would always look at her and I would see her doing her, you know, her monologues and stuff in, in front of people. And I would just be like, Oh, I, I would be freaking out harder than her because my heart was beating. It just even imagining doing that. It was the scariest thing in the world to me. And when I started shooting videos, mm. I was horrible on camera. Mm. And in the last couple of years, I shot over 2000 videos. And at some point along there, meaning it was not a, it was not something I observed. I had to accept I'm not good on camera, but I'm just going to keep shooting. And at some point I realized I went, holy shit, I actually got comfortable on camera. I don't know when it happened. And you know when I realized it? So in school, it wouldn't matter if I was in a class of 10 people in some specialist class in college, 10 people. If I had to give my speech, I would be sweating. My heart would be beating. I would be gulping. I would be scared shitless. I, I would dread it all week. I would hope that I could be the first one up just to get it over with. And when it was over, I would just be so glad it was over, right? <laughs> to speak in front of 10 people. You know what I'm talking about when you have to speak in front of people? It was the biggest fear for me. And I always marveled at how my wife could do that. So one of my best friends uh, played in the NFL, which is the, um, um, the American Football League, which is really, really big. And he had a party when he retired. And he asked me to speak. And I had to speak in front of like 500 people. And I was just like, holy shit. And I go up there and I get in front of the mic in front of 500 people. And I swear to God, I felt calm. And I was like, wow, this is going to be easy. And I threw away my speech and I just went after it. And I had delivered an incredible speech. But it just shifted from the practice. It's like, it's like so many other skills in life. Some people are naturally inclined, some aren't, but you really can get skills down. It's just like getting to where you can do chin-ups 
and it, and it, it's this is mental chin ups, and everyone has their own mental chin ups. You know what I mean? And mine was mine was public speaking, which is really funny now because now people will often ask me about that, and my only like I don't have any tricks for it. My only advice is just keep going because I'm a natural non-speaker. Just keep putting the camera on and keep filming and keep fi and eventually you'll forget that you're talking to a camera. And that really takes a while to forget that you're talking to a camera. Eventually you'll realize you're just talking either to the other person, like I'm talking to you, you know what I mean? Or when it's just rolling and, and you're not talking to someone, you'll, you'll kind of get this, that you're talking to someone who needs that data. You know what I mean? And so, so you just keep your passion. You keep talking to that person, keep talking. And eventually it'll just get natural, but there's no, my trick is that is to, forget about trying to find a trick and just keep putting the freaking camera on and eventually you'll be good at it. And that's what I tell my guys. And I've seen that in my athletic truth group, my other teammates, I've seen the same thing on them and they just get better on camera and better on camera, even if they started really bad at it. So hopefully that tip can help someone out there. Definitely. <laughs> you know, just, definitely. And I think it, you kind of touched upon something that's really valuable as well, which is that um, spending as much time in an area where you're uncomfortable is so valuable yep. anything in life yep. it kind of shifts you yep. over to where that becomes the normal you're perfectly okay with that and it's the same that's thing what my strength people. training is exactly yeah. same with strength training same with diet like it's uncomfortable yeah. not to eat the things that you want to eat but once yeah. you do that for a little while all of a sudden it's nah i don't even crave them it's perfectly fine and you start right. to enjoy the whole other side of it so no um i think that's a brilliant place to uh, to end the podcast but um uh, before we go, uh, where can everybody find your material? Of course, knees over toes guy on Instagram, but yeah, that that's definitely the best. I'll get back to you under 24 hours on Instagram. If you have any questions at knees over toes guy, I say that's the best place because I, I'm not a natural social media guy, right? So I don't have all the different things. I started with Instagram and I'm like, you know what? Let me just try to get good at this. So I haven't even tried to get good at any of these other platforms yet, but I know that I'll get back to you fast on Instagram. So that's, that's a good place to find me. Perfect. Well, Ben, thanks so much for your time today. Yeah, you're very welcome. That was fun.